Welcome back to The Move, where we're vibing through the book 10 minutes at a time. I'm your host, Justin Ku, and in today's episode, we actually have something special for you guys. Normally, we pick a, a section of the Bible and we spend about 10 minutes in it. Today, we're doing a little bit something that's that's different. We've assembled our team, uh, most of us, not the entire cast of The Move, but we're here today to have a conversation, uh, maybe a reaction and a reflection on a very popular podcast called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. If this is a new story to you, basically, long story short, there was a church in Seattle called Mars Hill Church run by a pastor by the name of Mark Driscoll. Um, Some of us in our group, we we listened to many of the messages kind of in our maybe earlier ministry years. Some of us have never heard of him until like the last month or two as we were preparing for this podcast. And so we just want to kind of process through some of the things that have happened because, um, well, there's a lot of lessons to learn and things to reflect on, questions to ask that I think are going to be really important. Just as a heads up, if you are wanting to kind of skip ahead in the conversation, there will be kind of a timestamp below this video where you can see kind of the different sectional breaks in the conversation. So that way you can navigate through it a little bit more quickly if that's something that you're interested in. Normally, I would introduce my guests today, but if you've been with us through the move, you already know them. And if not, then it, I guess it really doesn't matter. You'll get to know them during this conversation. So let's go ahead and dive in. One of the things that we wanted to toss around was just this like very real honest question. Why was this podcast so popular? This was perhaps maybe the most talked about podcast within the Christian world um, in the last year. And I guess, do you guys have any insights as to why this was such a popular phenomenon? I got on this podcast after many people in my online world and personally were like really trying to get me on it. And I was like, ah, it looks super long. I have lots of things to listen to. Bruh, like... Five minutes in, I was 100% hooked. Like, the music. And it was like, it was like ecclesiological, like, church true crime, which is also like a major genre right now. But it was it was compelling and it was mysterious and it was emotional and storytelling. So just the, just the production of it was so good. But then as I listened, I saw how it was pulling on all these threads that are showing up in conversations I'm having on Twitter or the things I'm reading, articles and and conversations in real life and all this, like on gender and Christianity, especially like muscular Christianity and Jesus and John Wayne kind of stuff. Um, Thinking about deconstruction and if, is it, is it blossoming in the church as a useful medicine or is it destroying the church through, you know, secular infiltration? You know, is it necessary? What, whatever. How do we relate to deconstruction? So I just thought pulling on all these different themes that are showing up everywhere and with this amazing production and, and, and people find themselves in this story. And maybe you find yourself aligning with a victim or a hero or a villain or somebody in between. But I think people found themselves right in the middle of the rise and fall of Mars Hill. It it absolutely struck on so many themes that we're seeing played out in culture. I think about the Me Too or I guess the Church Too movements. I mean, that has touched so many people that I know. And and I just want to applaud those who who are having the courage to come out with that and to deal with that and in the ways that are important to them. Um, I, I'm trying to remember back to when I first kind of came across Mark Driscoll. I know that some of us, maybe we were, we, we didn't, we weren't exposed to him, but I remember one of the first things was actually finding a, a sermon of his on the Sabbath. And it was the first time that I heard a non Seventh day Adventist really talking about the Sabbath. And to me, it was compelling. Um, I grew up with, you know, the kind of parents that were a little bit harder that, you know, immigrant parents traditionally are, don't, they don't have the same restraint that uh, families that are raised in the United States often have. And so the style and the approach, the abrasiveness to me were, were all features. I was like, man, here's someone who really can grab my attention. Here's someone who I, I, I maybe even respect the, the sternness and the firmness with which he, he handles things. I, I, I resonated deeply with the way that he built up uh, the responsibilities of what it meant to be a man. Because I knew that in my life at the time, I was, I was falling short on a lot of those things. And so for me, one of the things that drew me to the show was this sense of, you know what, 
yeah, I can do better, I should do better, and I will do better. And so the message is related to me a lot. And, and that was actually what I was really curious about the, the whole series was I had heard that the church had fallen into disarray, but I didn't really know why. And so I was actually genuinely curious as to what had happened. Here was, a, here was someone who had impacted my life, in, not nearly to the extent that I was visiting his church or any of that kind of stuff, but I paid attention a little bit and I was impacted in the ministry. And from what I saw, I, I was pleasantly impacted. And I think that seems to be, I mean, I think that there's to say like, what, why is it popular in one like phrase I think is impossible because I think it, it's a culmination of just, just a huge amount of like spectacle um, things that were happening. But I think that's maybe one of the biggest is we love, I mean, I don't, I think as a society, we love to see behind the scenes of like what's going on. And because Mark Driscoll had become a literal celebrity like when it when everything gets destroyed it it happened pretty quick i mean if if you listen to the podcast like it wasn't like over this 7 year period everything was super public and people knew that there were struggles it seemed like all of a sudden everything was like going really really strong and then all of a sudden it was destroyed and gone and so then i feel like there was a, probably a lot of people left kind of thinking what in the world just happened and so then when a podcast comes out that is just extraordinarily made, that gives you like all of the interviews with all of the people. And and I remember every episode just hearing um, that the, the the intro where like Mark Driscoll is like yelling and just like every single episode waiting. I'm like, is it this episode that I'm going to know what's happening? Is it this episode that I'm going to get to know what's happening? They just did an amazing job, I think, at giving people what they what they had been looking for in the same way that like, if like the Kardashian empire just like d got destroyed tomorrow, everyone would be like, what happened? I want to know. And it's just this, like we have an obsession with celebrity, especially when it comes to the fall of celebrities. We love that as a society. I just want to say to the, the celebrity point. Uh, so I actually, I, I knew, I knew the name, but I definitely had, when I heard about this podcast with Mark Driscoll, I definitely had it confused with Phil Driscoll, who I believe is one of the producers on The Adventures in Odyssey, which I grew up listening to. And uh, I, just so whoever's listening knows, everybody's laughing right now. They're just muted. It was a funny joke, but and it's not a joke. I really thought, like, Mark Driscoll. <laughs> like, I really thought this. Um, and so then... Uh, as I listened to the first, I think the first episode was the summary, right? Where it's like this broad strokes. Um, what ended up happening was I was very captivated. And I thought that was the whole podcast because it was like the summary. So I actually stopped listening and um, thought that I knew the whole story. And it turns out I did not. I did not. There's so much more. In, in one of the, in one of the, the celebrity falling and stuff. I think that there's also a, it, it probably it, it kind of plays both ways of like being very cautious on why we, we watch this. And I think that that's something that around the, the last episode uh, comes up. And um, it's, if you're watching this to say, Oh, look at those people. Like I would never fall for that. I would have never been in the group of, then you miss the whole point. And I think that that's important to keep in mind because if, if you're watching this or if you're like, if you're listening to this podcast, just to, to gloat on, on the mistakes the church makes again, or to gloat on another celebrity pastor that fails again. And you're like, ha, see, I knew it. Then you're missing the whole point. And you're like, your behavior is actually like the behavior you're condemning, you know, that, that, that that's, that's something important to see. I, I know that for me, as I've, as I've looked at this, cause I had no idea who a uh, Mark uh, Driscoll was. Um, uh, isn't like, there's a, there's a Christian, uh, there's a trumpet guy, Phil Driscoll also. Uh, also yeah, Phil yeah, Driscoll yeah. might be the same. I'm yeah, not entirely sure. He, he plays the trumpet and my parents loved him. Um, and anyways, uh, I had no idea who Mark Driscoll was. I immigrated to the States back in 2003. So at the height of his popularity, and I was in a small little uh, church in New Mexico. So I, I had heard of him later on in the seminary, somewhere here or there. So it's just interesting to see how this this story is is so compelling, and um, also it gave me some context because I I currently pastor in in the Seattle area. So this this whole idea just it hooked me from the very first episode. I was like, oh, 
okay. Because just like Kiss Your Rain, I was like, I I got other podcasts to listen. This what you want me to listen to fifteen episodes? No, that's too. Oh, 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 really? Hmm. And you begin to identify with a lot of things. But I think the biggest thing for me, the the, the draw for me, has been the lessons learned. Um, not necessarily the uh, watch somebody fall and celebrate it. That's jacked. Um, but oh, wow! Like that—that that could be me, or et cetera, et cetera. That—that's been the pull for me. You know? Yeah, I, I'm really curious about that. In in what ways did you see yourself in the story? I know that for for me, a large part of it was actually seeing myself in in Mark Driscoll, which I don't know that that that's felt scary to say out loud. <laughs> but but it, it was true. I mean, there was so much that I saw in his ambition and his drive to accomplish great things, especially early on in the narrative. It seemed like he was he really had some some great ideas, and and God was really working through him. And so I know what that's like on a, on a much smaller scale. And I know kind of the the shiny effect of influence and how how exciting it is when you see you know your plans and your dreams and your visions that are created and you're unsure of what's going to happen and it starts to work. So I, I saw myself a lot in him. I was like, man, like I can understand why uh, he, he emerges with this level of confidence because here he is ministering in a city where very few, if any, have had meaningful success. It's a largely secular area and it seems like he's able to draw a crowd from the, 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 the kinds of people that historically don't want to go to church, young single men. And I think that that's just, it's, it's an awesome thing that was happening, but clearly, I don't know, it, it clearly got away from him. But I, I guess I, what I'm curious is like, where did you see yourself in this? All of us here work in some way, shape or form with, for, or alongside the church. Um, did you see yourself in, in, in the narrative at, at all? I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> in, in the narrative more, I, I'd like to identify more the narrative than the person, uh, you know, kind of like I, I don't I, I have no beef with Mark Driscoll uh, you know I, I I don't know him so I don't this is not a, a a chastisement on him but like the there was one thing that that came up um, a couple of times I think in the podcast where they mentioned that success preceded character and that that's uh, yeah that's painfully true you know when you find yourself in a in a successful place, um, at a young ish age, you know, it's like you showed up only 11 years before and you were in a small little church plan. And here you are 11 years later, poof, you're at a college campus, you know, and again, kind of like you, Justin, obviously in an incredibly smaller microscopic, uh, influence, uh, if, if we're to compare, but that idea of thinking that you've arrived, and that, you know, you don't need to submit to anybody um, because, you know, they don't have a church as large as yours. Like, ugh. you know, all of a sudden you begin to to find yourself sitting alone on the top, but not because you're a leader, just because you really don't want anybody around you. And that's painful, man. You know, that's that, that it, it's this hubris and you think you're doing right because you have certain success, you know but you're you're not cuz you're measuring success the wrong way in the kingdom of heaven that's that's one part you know that's one narrative definitely of a flaw that all of us can go through so th is this this is i mean kind of an adventist we're all adventist uh in ministry the podcast we have a lot of adventist listeners i know they're not all adventists but adventists typically are very familiar with the great controversy and uh I was, I have read it once, I think. And for whatever reason, randomly, I was on the plane a couple of days ago and I was like, kind of want to read it. Ended up being really dope. This guy next to me saw Zwingli on, on my iPad and he was like, Zwingli, oh, the Swiss Reformation. You know, started this cool conversation, super random. But anyways, as I was reading about this, <clears throat> this idea of, you know, charisma outpaced character, success outpaced character, there was something and I'm trying to find it about luther uh, where she talks about how oh i think i actually just found it uh luther there's she she wrote this thing that i think is really relevant there were results more precious than these to be secured when he actually was 
put in the mountain. He was hidden, you know, on, on this thing. Luther was hiding in this mountain. And it says, in the solitude and obscurity of his mountain retreat, Luther was removed from the earthly supports and shut out from human praise. He was thus saved from the pride and self-confidence that are so often caused by success. By suffering and humiliation, he was prepared again to walk safely upon the dizzy heights to which he had so suddenly been exalted. And so, and then it talks about as men rejoice in the freedom which the truth brings them, they are inclined to extol those whom God has employed to break the chains of error and superstition. So it's just this really like, I feel like it's a very relevant um, pattern that when people experience something significant, they tend to exalt the person that brought it to them. And I can relate with that in, in a very personal way where like, the people who brought the gospel to me that actually changed my life, like this deep gratitude and respect, right? And how in the case of Luther, in this, in the, when you study the Reformation, this time period actually served to help preserve humility, I think is a really beautiful picture, right? Of, but also, I mean, it's telling of, of what is so natural to happen when you do see success. A question that I kind of have for you guys who have listened to more of the, of the podcast than me is, I guess, along the lines of the theology, like, because that, that would be to say, like, the pattern of truth breaking chains. We read it in there. It's like truth breaking chains. Um, is it possible that there's something that's being presented that is impactful, but not necessarily the truth that people are also responding in the same way in the same pattern would be taking place. Does that make sense? My question. Is it? Nobody's really. No, I, I, is it? Let me see if I understand your question. Like, it sounds like you're saying, is there, could it be that there is something that is being said that, that draws people but is not necessarily the truth is is that is that the question yes yes yeah because that's certainly the pattern right of like when truth is presented throughout history right like chains break and people respond and they're so grateful and they're excited and there's a movement and the people who are proclaiming the truth can be tempted to feel proud but is it possible that you could preach something that's not the truth you could teach something that's not the truth and yet the same pattern would ensue. I mean, yeah, I guess popularity, um, you know, popularity or, or, or truth telling, you know, the, I'm um, thinking of this idea in, in Spanish, no, confura, no confundas uh, gordura con hinchazón. Now I'm going to have to translate this whole thing. Oh, why did I say it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, what yeah you, say. it says do not, do not confuse, um, do not confuse being well fed with being swollen kind of it's kind of like this idea of you know because sometimes that it, it can look like it's big but it's just swollen it's not fat you know and yeah. and i think that that could be the case that sometimes we're presenting something that could be awesome and even necessary and perhaps even relevant but it's not necessarily the truth as 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 we would understand it as the gospel understands it uh, uh, you know uh, yeah I, I see here that I have significant theological doctrinal difference with what Mars Hill was known to teach, um, what their tenets were. So I'll just say that, like, there's a lot we have in common, and yet I have some definite theological differences. And I, you know, thinking the way I do, I think those theological differences had a part to play in the dysfunction of Mars Hill. But to me, something that is speaking to me as I, as I go through this podcast and reflect on it is about what if you say a true thing in an untrue way? What if you say a true thing in a mm. true-ish way in a system that is set up for falsehood? Come on. In the sense that if, I, if I'm operating in a whole system where leadership is being op, you know, perceived in a certain way, even if I say something true or true-ish, it's pretty close. It's truth adjacent, <laughs> you know, like it's close enough. Um, <laughs> is that, 
is it going to have holy righteous effects? Is it going to have healing shalom effects? And I, I can't help but think of when Paul is, is writing to his protege, Timothy, you know, his kind of pastor in training. And we all look up to Paul and, and I don't know, maybe we look up to Timothy, at least like he got some letters in the Bible. Um, <laughs> you know, he got something, He's uh, but like, yeah, but what Paul says to him, you know, his charge to him and he, he gives him all this pastoral advice. You want to know how to be a pastor? Like read these pastoral epistles as they're called, including second Timothy. And, and he says, Hey, Timothy, this is chapter three, verse 10. You have observed my teaching. And he's going to say, do exactly what I've done, right? You've observed my teaching, but not just teach what I teach. You've observed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love. And he goes on and on. And it's like, you have to have not just the word of righteousness in your ministry. You have to have the way of righteousness. It's not, I saying true mm -hmm. things matters more than most people think, maybe more than I even understand saying true things, super, super matters. But even if I say something true or something true-ish, you know, there, there, there needs to be examination of, am I also imitating the way of righteousness? I, Oh, go ahead. No, I, you go ahead first. I was just going to say, like, I can relate with, like, the truth sometimes cuts on its own. Yeah. Like, the truth is scathing no matter how gentle you say it sometimes. And so to have love and patience and compassion, like, I love the way that you worded it. And I can't remember how you worded it anymore. I just know it touched my heart. But, like, the truth is offensive enough on its own. Yeah. Like, have I mean, grace the, and righteousness. This is what I'm thinking is like, you're absolutely right. The, the word of God already divides. It already cuts. And so to intentionally, whether for effect or for whatever, to, to go out of your way to make sure that it cuts, I think is, is an interesting, like, I get why. I, I know that that was me at, at an earlier season of my ministry. I, I very much was thinking about how do I say things in the sternest way possible, just because that was what grabbed my attention at the time. And, but I started to see that it wasn't necessarily bearing fruit in my own life, that, that the kind of character transformation that I think that, you know, is, is important for, for, for us to go through. Like I was, I was kind of missing that. I, I was just becoming more cynical and more frustrated, more angry. And I, I think part of it was that I wasn't just frustrated with others that they weren't doing it right. But I think my true frustration was actually in the, in my own mirror that that I wasn't living up to my own standard. And so I was shaming and pointing the finger at myself. They say that, that idea, like when you point the finger, there's careful, there's three more fingers pointing right back at you. And that was 100% true for me was that the, 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 the messages that I went hardest on were often rebukes to myself. And, and I don't, I don't know. I, I, I can't fathom what's happening in his inner life, but I wonder if, if there's an element of that for, for, for Mark at play as well. You, you know, they, they say that, uh, I've heard the saying before that the preachers preach themselves first, you know, um, and, and maybe there is some of that, uh, but the whole, you know, what Kissy Rain you brought up and, and I don't know how this conversation has gone. I'm, I'm reminded of Ephesians chapter four and how Paul says, you know, Hey, so, and he's been building up in Ephesians one, two, three, and now he's going to start in four. So, okay. So as a prisoner of Christ, I entreat you walk according, right? walk in a worthy way to the calling you've been called to. And then he's going to basically list the fruits of the spirit. Like he's basically listing the fruits of the spirit in love, you know, with gentleness and patience, uh, keeping the bonds of peace. And then he's going to go into this one God, one thing, but uh, one God, one spirit, you know, but what he is actually talking about, it seems to me as I, as I think about this text is that those fruits are the tangible ways and the tangible results of the truth living in your life. That that's the tangible way you measure it. And you, you can't mimic that. So um, to, to go into your, the question you posed uh, a while back, I, I think that truth, truth can't be spoken in, in places where, where it's not spoken in the right way or where the system doesn't allow for it to, to be said in such a way that it is transforming. It can look good, kind of like a wax fruit in a, in a real fruit. They 
look the same, but once you bite into that, Ugh. you know, it's, it's, it's waxy, fruity. Yeah. I think what's really interesting here is like, I think we're, this is all true. And I think the weird, almost like mix up that happened in the Mars Hill story is like Driscoll starts to see fruit coming that is not at all like personal fruit from the gospel. Like he, it almost seems like he found this like really cool tool, which is truth, which started like, like affecting people. And then he was like, oh sweet, I'm going to keep using this thing versus like any kind of like personal accountability or checks. Like it was all about, I don't know. It seemed like he really found like a, yeah, like a success tool and he just kept using it. And he kept, and he thought that like, because it was successful, like you can keep going. And he saw like a type of fruit. And so then therefore he was like, let's keep on going. But he didn't see like the fruit that we're talking about. And this is like the really weird part that like, Kessie, you were talking about like, how is it that, because it does seem like people's lives were being changed for the good. Like people were coming to know Jesus, like, but at the very same time, like it's clear that it there wasn't this like personal fruit and there wasn't this like, I don't know, like love. Like the, I, and it's like, it's mind boggling to me and I don't think I fully understand it. So if you guys do, please help me. I for sure don't fully understand it, but I, I thought a lot about that listening to this story is what what are we even talking about when we're talking about success? Because on one hand, it's like, wow, praise the Lord. All these people, you know, they're, they're probably like meeting their spouses and they're like being called into holiness and they're giving their lives to Jesus and, and they're experiencing the satisfaction of discipleship and, and so much good. But it's paired with this dysfunction, this deep spiritual dysfunction. And, you know, how do I make sense of that? Is this like, well, God is, you know, doing the best with what he's got, you know, what he's being given. Is it that we, um, you know, that, that no story is ever fully light or fully darkness? Um, you know, I had, I had a lot of that question myself and, and in trying to make sense of the Mars Hill story for myself and, and trying to think about what do I think success is for me and how are we measuring it? Because, we don't want to be gratified by some church's failure. Like that's grievous. This is grievous. But I have to understand it in the context of this church and this pastor specifically were lauded and upheld and standing on a platform of celebrity because of what you're talking about, Ben, because of success. And when you go, when you, when you're on a conference circuit about you know, successful church planters. And I, I've been involved in two church plants myself. And I remember listening to Mark Driscoll in 2007, I was doing urban ministry and I was in, you know, and listening to him talk his, his series on Nehemiah and taking the city for God was so inspiring to me. And, you know, you hear like, this is getting a hundred thousand downloads and, and he's doing this and thousands of people baptized. And this is what they take in. So the way we're measuring it, people attending, people being baptized, people giving, people listening. In other words, what's your influence number? No one is ever asking, I mean, because maybe you couldn't even answer this question, but no one's asking when you're sitting at the center of the panel of experts and everyone's looking to you, you know, 30 year old Mark Driscoll and what he knows. No one's asking like, you know, how's your humility with your wife? I want to wait, you know, before we talk about what success is, before you mentor us, we just want to make sure, you know, like, do people on your team feel respected? You know, we, we, we don't ask those questions and maybe because we can't answer them, but there, it, it, it to me is talking about the, the difficulty of naming success and the problem of celebrity. I just, there's, there's something I, I can relate with on a personal level where, there's somebody that I greatly respect who has been key in discipling me in just freedom and this life in the spirit. And, and I remember there was one time where he got in his feels about something and started, started acting from those feels. And it was the first time that I realized like, this is somebody I have great respect for and is my older brother in Jesus. 
like when Hebrews, I think it's Hebrews 13 or something, it says like, we have to give an account for, for you when it comes to salvation, like pray for us, your leaders. Like this is somebody that I would consider one of my leaders. And I remember this inner conflict of like, I don't really want to say anything, right? I don't, I don't want to say anything to him in this situation. He'll figure it out. And I could see him spiraling in his feels. This was a while back, like maybe a year and a half ago. And, uh, and another brother encouraged me, like, this is what we do in the body. What does the Bible say? Like, should we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Just because we have truth and there's absolutely fruits around us that like the truth is setting people free. If we see one another starting to stumble, sometimes, and especially if we have a pure conscience, like if we are living in the purity of heart and the purity of mind that Jesus paid such a high price for us to have, then we may not see when we start to stray. And so trusting others to be able to come alongside and say like, hey, I am one of your brothers in Christ. Like I'm journeying with you and I'm close to you and I see this thing and I got to call it out. What's that about, right? And so in this cer certain circumstance, thanks to the encouragement from another brother, I was able to say something and it, it kind of rubbed him the wrong way. But at the end of the day, it was like this really beautiful, like, hey, thank you for saying that. You're right. I was in my feels. Um, and it was, it was all good, beautiful. Um, and in the same vein, there was somebody that, a, a young girl who has actually struggled with like people bigger than her imposing, just like, like feeling pressured just to make certain decisions, not, not anything crazy, but just frustrated that she doesn't necessarily always speak up for herself. And there was a time that I did something that she felt like had a little bit of an edge to it. Like it was a little bit of a response to some criticism that, just wasn't the most loving and she called me on it and as she called me on it I felt myself get a little defensive for a second and then I was just knowing her and the growth and also the fact that she did call me on it I was just like first of all thank you you're right there was a little bit of me puffing in response and second like hallelujah that you did that like I need people in my life that will always hold me to that and so maybe maybe the people that are at the conferences that aren't journeying through life it's hard to ever ask that question and it may not be the place but it's definitely the place of those people that are actually close to them to speak up and and call us to live according to the righteousness that is ours this is such a easy to overlook idea, right? The idea of accountability. And it's a key theme that we see in this series. But, you know, there's this movement in society to be like, I'm my own person. I'm free. And what it means by what we mean by free is like, I'm not accountable to anybody. I can do whatever I want. And man, it, it's just reflecting on this. And, I, and I, it makes me think of moments in my life where Tyler, just like you, I had people who, who were in my corner and in virtue of being in my corner, said the hard thing to me. And I just think about mm. it because I think back to my early 20s when I was I was having a degree of success in the little circle that I had when, when it came to my ministry and I was absolutely getting hot-headed and I was absolutely getting uh, maybe a little too brazen, not even maybe, I was getting too brazen with the way that I was carrying myself and, I, and I'm so grateful for a mentor who came into my life. I was like, yo, bro, you got to chill. Like this ain't cool. And and it, not with those words, but like that was the sentiment is that you're overreaching by a significant margin. And it, one of the things, and I'm, I don't do this perfectly, but it, it is something that I, I, I try to be conscious of is to make sure that when I have those figures in my life, to not let them go. Um, when I have people who, who love me enough to tell me with humility, with respect, with tact, with wisdom uh, to, to come alongside me and to, to encourage me. Yes but to also be willing to rebuke me when it's, when it's necessary. Those are the kinds of friends that you need. Those are the ones that stick closer to a brother. And, and I've tried at certain intervals in my life to actually to, to try to go out of my way to invite that because I know how hard it is. I, I, I'm not saying that this is something that I like or that I enjoy. It's not something that comes naturally in the sense that every time the words are shared, it's still like the, the, the walls, I feel them coming up. 
And yet I know how valuable uh, those moments are. Those are perhaps the most important moments for, for, for my growth and my development and just as a human being, much less as a leader. I think that that's where, um, you know, I, you're right. You know, the, the whole idea of like not having somebody uh, and, and it goes back to how you personally see who can speak into your life. Right. And this is where sometimes you might, I, I know that for me at a, at a time um, it was, there were only certain people that I looked up to, but it was in function of their professional standing that I was like, yeah, I'll listen to him. Right. Or if you're, or, right, or if I would perceive that you're slightly smarter than me, then I'm like, okay, I might listen to you. But it wasn't necessarily from a place of like listening to somebody who these people that were smarter or had more success than me weren't necessarily people that had a relationship with me or that were in my life as as friends, right? And I think that that is part of the part of the problem is like surrounding yourself with enough friends that can actually call you to the carpet at some point. And be like, yo, listen, you know, that, that can be, um, in my case, Herald whispers, right. Like that, that could, that could say things mm -hmm. and I'd be like, Hmm. And you eventually discover people in your life that are there. They might not be a whole lot, but it's really important that you have them and that you know that the relationship is built in such a way in the bonds of peace and in the bonds of Christ and the bonds of the, of the Christian gospel freedom that you have that these people are going to not do it for because they hate you because they don't like you, but because they're seeing something that doesn't line up with what, what you should be living out. You're not walking according to the way to the calling that you've been called. And it's going to be said in such a way that it, you might bristle at it a little bit, you know, but you're going to know that since it's one of y'all, you know, or the people in my life, I'll be like, Oh, maybe I should listen, you know, uh, because that is the, the cry in society today, like Justin said, you know, to quote the great uh, Scandinavian philosopher, Elsa of Arundel, no right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. <laughs> <laughs> well done, well done, well done. I haven't read her. I haven't read her. Oh, it's, it's, my, it's my daughter's favorite she's philosopher. She's more of a, she's she's more of a verbal, a verbal yes. teacher than yes. a, she doesn't verbal. write many things. Yeah. No. But she's got a podcast. Impactful nonetheless. <laughs> yes, podcasts. <laughs> impactful nonetheless. What, you know, what I'm hearing here that, and I think is, is really valuable is, is kind of touching on accountability. Who do we answer to? We heard, I think two forms of, I think we were confronted in this Mars Hill pod podcast about two forms of accountability. And what we've been talking about here is that kind of maybe soft accountability, like someone who can really speak to your life that you will listen to. Number one, they exist. Number two, they have access to you. Number three, you will heed. Um, and that's super important. And I appreciate hearing from you, Tyler, too, um, and Harold about, you know, the dynamics that play for what would make us resist even speaking to someone that we respect or that is in spiritual leadership, because that's underlying this whole narrative and, and the experiences many or most of us have had in churches at various times, which is the role of power. And when you have somebody up on a platform that is, you know, I'm in jeans and I'm wearing like a necklace and I say, dude, you know, is that someone that is like, it, does that person have more or less power than someone wearing vestments who stands super far away and is in a, is in a denomination that has really hierarchical, you know, I think we look at one of those as like, Oh, this person has a lot more power. And then like, this guy's just a pastor. So by the time Mark Driscoll became a celebrity, I think you could see some of that power on display, but for other people just doing ministry, like we have to reckon, I think, with the fact that we have power and we have spiritual authority. So when we speak to things mm -hmm. or when we give advice, like we have to steward that really responsibly because even if we're, you know, just out here in sweatshirts and t-shirts or whatever, and someone comes to us and they're talking about something, if we pretend that we we don't have more power in the relationship as a minister in some capacity, as a Bible teacher, as a pastor, as an elder, as a as an influencer, as a media personality, whatever. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna overstep. We're gonna say things in ways that we shouldn't. Um, and and that soft accountability I think is important. 
another a form of accountability that we, at least I was confronted with listening to this podcast and I've seen in action is the, the hard accountability, mm. the structural right. accountability. When mm. Mars Hill shifted from more people being able to say something to fewer people and there were probably reasons for that, but that got some people fired and marginalized and excluded. And we see how that changed the dynamic of the church over time. And I have been part of a church that had a non-traditional government structure, shall we say. And I, we, we joke, you know, in our Adventist community, we nominate a group that nominates the nominating committee and those people nominate people for positions. And we go ahead and we vote like, can this person really be trusted to pick up the offering? You know, um, she's not <laughs> exactly. No, like, no, this is, this really is Adventism. Is. Death by committee. Uh, uh, unfortunately. Right. And so we, we joke about it. Like there's this great, I think back when it was Florida hospital church, which is now whole life church, you know, they had this like parody video about it, like nominating, nominating. Here. And so I get it like red tape and all that. So, I've been part of churches that do it that way. And I I've been part of a church that didn't do it that way. But I, anyway, I will, I will summarize my story briefly to say I have been on the wrong side of someone who didn't have enough formal accountability and who used marginalization and spiritual shaming and these kinds of tactics and there was no recourse. There was no one that, you know, you didn't know who the accountability team was and they never met without the leader. And uh, he could appoint people and then unappoint them from offices. And there was no nominating committee and no one nominated the nominating committee and all, and all that kind of stuff. And I saw how that led to a spiritually toxic environment that ultimately ended up with me getting kicked out of a church, being told I could not even attend anymore and I wasn't to study the Bible with any of these people and and all this kind of stuff. And and it went against any kind of formal structure that an Adventist church would have had. Um, so even though we poo-poo it and all that stuff, but like the structures of our church, they can get overblown, they can be re-examined, but just let's do it thoughtfully, I guess, because I've seen it go wrong. And isn't that isn't that the way like kingdom when we talk kingdom of heaven, isn't that what it is where it's like power? Is it Philippians two where Jesus says, or Paul says that Jesus did not see equality with God as something to be grasped, but humbled himself. And this is the, to the point of death, right? And this is, this is the kingdom of God on display where it's an inverted power structure to what the world would understand. And so, yeah, that's, that's why, even in our churches, that's why we have committees for committees for committees, and they have to be lay people up to a certain extent because we want to actually model that. Uh, and I think that's great. But there's something that both of you guys said that made me think about just how, um, uh, Harold, you, you were talking about something that made me think about community and how one of the hard things is that when the people who speak into our life are celebrities, they're not actually part of our community. When they're authors, they're not part of our community. And if it's a massive church and they're our pastor, they're still not part of our community. And so they don't actually see into our lives. True. And so all they're, all they're ever really doing is giving us advice and we're trying to live according to it. But ultimately there's no, there's no life speaking directly to me. There's nobody that's like, Tyler, I saw that you kind of, you kind of, brushed your wife off in that, that circumstance because they can't, they wrote a book five years ago and I read it. You know what I'm saying? And so the beauty of having community, like I'm in a tiny church right now, <laughs> like there's 15 of us that meet on a weekly basis. And I'm not, there's, I, I really miss big church. Like I miss College View Church and being able to go to church with 800 people. And when you sing and everybody's singing, you could hear all the voices. I miss that. And I think that there's something that's so needed and beautiful about it. But it cannot neglect that the body of Christ has to be a small, like we have to be a family where we're doing life together. Because in that, it's so much easier within that, like the five of us that are here right now, right? Where we're we're going through life. And then I can say like, if there's somebody like my friend I mentioned earlier, 
where I can tell her if I know that there is some kind of power imbalance, according to the world, I can tell her like, listen, there's going to be times where you're going to see this. And I need you to know that you have the Holy Spirit and the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. And if you see me doing something sideways, you trust that and you call me out because we are a family. Like we're doing this life together. It almost sounds like you're describing small communities, small groups. Would, small groups. Would that be a thing? Something small like Small groups. Yeah. Would that be something? Small groups. That, that's a, we should we should make that a, a thing where where churches maybe thing. they divide into smaller subsections of the body. Yo, that maybe would be crazy. Like we can do life together, right? That would be that would be insane. I'm gonna try it in my church. <laughs> Try it out. <laughs> I'll tell you guys how it goes. I the the whole power structures. I mean, Kessie Rain, you were speaking uh, and describing your experience, which uh, sounds terrible. Um, and I and I I hate that you went through it. Um, uh, zero out of ten. Do not recommend spiritual abuse or getting kicked yeah. out of your church. And I think yeah. that there's there you know even in even within our own committee based. Um, structures that were made uh, intentionally i believe to avoid this type of thing you can still um abuse and get abused you, you can still you can you can still get uh kicked out of your church yeah so let me okay this this is the question that's been on my heart i'm sorry i totally cut you cool. off uh okay so I, I this is something I thought about a lot and then this podcast drove it so hard in my heart and is it possible to work for the church and avoid being hurt injured oh. by the church can you work for the church and I maybe there's a time <laughs> maybe you can do it for six months or six years or 60 years or something but like can you work for the church and avoid being wronged by the institution I, of the I, church? Because mm -hmm. I see Ben shaking his head. Okay, I want to hear more about that because I have an inkling that it's the same answer. Well, and I, and but I want to hear more. Like, why are you shaking your head? Like, like well, no, I was just I was shaking it. my head just because. Like, well, I think the you asked two different questions to me. I think like one is can you avoid um, being hurt, and then the second is can you avoid being wronged. And that's where, when you said, can you avoid being hurt? I was like, uh, I mean, probably, maybe, I don't know. But then can you avoid being wronged? I would say absolutely not. Just because I, I don't think that like, <laughs> okay. that's the prerogative. Like, I think if that was the prerogative of the organization is to not wrong you, then maybe. But like, I don't think, and this is, I mean, I'm very inexperienced in this, all of this. You guys have all had much more experience than me, but like the prerogative of the church organization is not geared towards not hurting, especially those who work for it. And I think that like, I've just seen so much pain, like just growing up in the church from people who try to lead. Um, and I think that that pain doesn't necessarily like, it's not even necessarily like people are intentionally hurting, but I think it's like the fact that they are a part of a community that, is living life together and life is hurtful sometimes and we interact from our hurt and from our pain and from our feelings and i just don't like i just yeah so can you avoid being wronged i think i or can they like are you not going to get wronged i think definitely not can you avoid being hurt though i'd say probably maybe someone i don't know who knows <laughs> um but isn't this like the whole reason why being very committed to following in the footsteps of jesus is is so important right because here, here's a man who literally did everything right. And it was the institution. It was the church that put him to death. And I think that that's one of the things that we have to be willing to, to accept if we're going to attempt to servant lead the church, right? To do it in the way that Jesus did it is to recognize that no matter what we do, there's, there's, it's going to require a level of giving up your life for others. Not because necessarily people are, are out to get you and there's conspiracies. It's not necessarily because traps are set, but because the thing that is required to win people over is self-sacrifice. Uh, at least if we see Jesus's life as any indicator of, of a model of how we do things. And uh, so I don't know, like, can we avoid getting hurt? I think it's part of the job. I think it's, it might actually be the job description is to suffer 
for the sake of other people, maybe. But you hate when it's your yeah. own family, right? I heard, like, I heard someone say that yeah. sheep bite. Oh, they do. And if you're shepherding, sheep Ooh. bite. Like, that's just have part you, of it. Have you seen that video? It's it's a popular, it's like a little 15 minute clip, a 15 second clip on like Instagram. I think it's in Germany. I'm assuming it's in Germany somewhere where there's a flock of sheep and there's this guy and this one sheep rams him in the middle of the road and they're they're like commenting in German. I like it's and then like the guy gets up after he's been rammed and then the sheep like just rams him in the head and knocks him out while he's on the ground. Like dude, that is that's legit. And uh, Yeah, anybody and been there? I, I think that being wronged Man, Cass, that is such a good and I, I I agree with Ben, being hurt and being wronged, right? Being hurt is it almost sounds like Ben, you're dividing being hurt is the result of what you can do. Like I can avoid being hurt because of how I react to the wrong that's been done to me. I, I don't know if I'm following correctly. Um but the the wrong um I think what stings the most, and I'll speak on my for me in my own experience, is when the wronger doesn't even care and doesn't even acknowledge that they wronged you. Like they literally do not care. And then to top it all off, they gaslight you and treat you as if they didn't do anything wrong. Like they come up to you and shake your hand if they're their long, your long lost friend at an event. They. But this is just Justin's point, right? Like the, to press into the highest form of forgiveness mm. that we've been granted mm. by Jesus. Like I, the number of times that I had in my past essentially given God the middle finger and been like, and I also don't care. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jesus on the cross, like father, forgive them. He, the man raises from the dead and the institutional church is like, it was a lie. Like we will pay you to tell everyone it was fake. You know, like, you know, the, the, I, I guess what I want to acknowledge maybe is that it hurts more because we know what the church should be. Like if you work for corporate dot ink, whatever, you're like, okay, there's going to be some manager who's this or that, or customers are going to be rude or whatever. And you don't like it, but it's like, all right, that's how people are. Then you come to the church and you're like, Hey, the body, like Jesus, spirit, Bible, truth, gospel, freedom, hallelujah, heaven, amen. And then those people are rude or manipulative or they slander you or they whatever. They do all the things that have happened. It hurts worse. And so when I think about spiritual abuse, I thought about this, like what makes it spiritual abuse? I think it's like regular abuse, but religious people Mm. are doing it. You know, it's like, it's, it's cloaked in religion. Like, well, I get to do this because I'm God's chosen person or like, well, are you on mission with God's mission? If not get out of here, you know, we use religious language or religious titles or religious explanations or whatever. And, but it's the worst kind of abuse, you know, like I've thought for myself that, you know, I grew up in a super dysfunctional home, love my parents, uh, but Lots of dysfunction happening there, but they were not Christian people. So I feel like I, I grew up, I learned the gospel, I forgave my parents, I moved on, but it would be way more confusing if you were in some sort of dysfunctional or abusive scenario and it was your religious parents perpetrating it Mm. against you, right? Like that's the worst kind of psychological abuse. So that's what makes, I think this kind of dynamic in the church, it's, it seems inevitable, but it's also super painful and the messiest kind. And like, I, I, I just want to be committed myself personally to not having any part in it. And in fact, being the kind of person who will say something, you know, like I, I, I want to be part of the solution because it, it's there's terrible. amen. There's a, a couple things. One expectations. Morgan and I, when we talk with, with couples a lot, we do a lot of like stuff with just young couples and things and, we found that expectations are extremely damaging to our ability to love people just, and that's something to unpack. But when you expect somebody to take out the trash and they don't do it, all of a sudden you're frustrated. And I found that like anytime we have expectations and they're unmet, we're frustrated. 
And if we have this expectation that our boss, you know, he's a secular dude, he's trying to make a buck and he's angry, like, well, my expectation was met, so I can deal. When my expectation's not met, I really, really struggle with that. And what I found is that the only thing that I can actually bank my expectations on are the things that Jesus has said. And he said, like, in this world, you're going to have hardships, you're going to have trials. And it, it, like, you can just look at, there's so many things. But also he said that we have peace in him, in him alone. Like, he said that we've been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Like, the only, he said that there is a, a divine inheritance. We have a new body coming our way. Like there's certain things that we can expect. And when we expect the things that he's told us, we can never be let down. And when we're let down, it makes it harder to love. When our expectations are unmet, it makes it harder to love. And which brings me to, I think, what almost it seems like the theme of this conversation is we've talked about this podcast, the story and the story of Mars Hill, which is the relationship of truth and love. And that you can't, you can't take one without the other. Like the truth is powerful and love is powerful, but love without truth, it's like giving a kid a hug, but not telling them that crossing the street might result in disaster, you know, it, and love and truth without love is as it's, it's just the worst. <laughs> it's just the worst. No one cares. It, one of the things I've been thinking about towards the beginning of a conversation is, is this idea of like, man, but, but he's preaching the gospel and lives are being changed, but there's this other element that's at work. And it, it just got me thinking about how truth is so much more than a series of prepositions. Um, truth is embodied. Truth is never not embodied. Um, and I think that this is what's so powerful about the incarnation. It's not just enough to say true prepositions, but truth must be lived. Truth must be expressed through being. And, and yeah, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, Cassia Rain. That's, that's, I want to be committed to, to doing that. And, and I want to be, have the humility to be able to say, you know what? When I don't get things wrong, I'm going to own that and I'm going to, I'm going to apologize and I'm going to do what I can to make restitution because, because that's not it. Uh, this is, that's not what I stand for. I'm not even about my own reputation. I don't want to be so defensive about what people think about me that I, I miss the most important, most important piece. Truth needs to be embodied. And I think that that's something that I'm, I'm really, I'm leaving this, this conversation. I'm leaving this experience with. Man, I've been I've been really blessed by this conversation. I had no idea what direction it was going to go, yeah. but I, it's it's just such a uh, and I think I don't know if I speak for everybody. I don't think we've just to be clear. I don't think we've even talked about how we feel about the theology of Mars Hill mm -hmm. or like the podcast, but just these themes. And I think probably a lot of us have issues with the theology, right? And we're not talking about mm -hmm. whether he was speaking the truth. However, these themes like. Yeah. truth and love i think of the woman at the well and jesus is like i think what does she say he, he he she asks him a question when she perceives that he's a prophet and he says you know the jews know a lot of truth they know a lot of truth but a time is coming when god is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and truth mm. and what are the fruits of the spirit love and joy mm. peace mm. patience kindness goodness gentleness faithfulness and self-control yeah and um it's spirit and truth spirit and truth i think the just to just in what you were saying and i, I love what you said man um it, and it ties really beautifully with what kiss your rain said of like i i'm proposing myself to be um the voice you know and not the voice that necessarily is calling out where things are wrong but like more embodying the truth um because truth and love right like if you What's the point of you just knowing 28 new trivia points about your Bible so you can go beat Catholics up with it? Like, what's the point of that? You know, and, and I got, and again, I have, I have no, I have no issue with the 28 points that we in our community of faith believe in. Like those, those don't get me wrong. But if all I'm doing is just teaching you how to win a debate with a Jehovah's witness and, and that is not transforming your life and you're not embodying love and love and truth, then ugh, 
We'll start over. Start over. Start like, over. Li- we're we're literally doing the same start thing. Over. Like you know, and and this once again goes back to like what we said at, at some point at the beginning of this conversation, of like if you're not looking at a story and and looking at it as a mirror, then you're missing the whole point, man. You know, because here we are, we could, you know, just like Ted said, we could be dissecting the theological differences that we have, which, yeah, we could spend another hour talking about that stuff and what it leads into. Yeah, 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 all good stuff. But listen, man, look at, we need to look at ourselves and and within the community of faith that we belong to, we need to be, start to hold ourselves accountable to, listen, what is this doing to your life? Like, how is this transforming you? How is this making you a better, how is this making you preach the gospel at all times? And if necessary, use words like if, if it's not doing that, then listen, man, let's close up shop and go. And unfortunately, I think that we're at a place um, that that we look at success and we measure it by how many indoctrinated Adventists we get. And 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 this is this is a I, I might get myself in hot water with this. Whoever's listening but we're in this point institutionally, it feels, and I, I look at it where, where it's like how many indoctrinated people we can get instead of like how many lives are we transforming? And it's because it's easier to see an indoctrinated person than to evaluate a transformed life because fruit takes time to mature, man. Like fruit is there, but it takes time to see it mature and see it grow. But it's easier to see an indoctrination point and you check out 28 points and you're like, done. And so we dip and we go, okay, we're done. We're successful. But the fact is that we're not because there is no transformation. There's no freedom. There's no life there, man. And if we're not doing that, like we're totally missing the point of this. And we're criticizing other people for not doing or preaching something wrong when we're not doing our own job, man. That Like, yeah, I that's that's it it has been a blessing to 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 hear this and not even going to the theological points but to 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 remember that we in the circles of influence that we have we are those voices of reason man yeah i think my takeaway here I, I, listening to the podcast i resonated so much and was able to process a lot and reflect a lot on the various things that i've gone through uh that have happened to me um but then also to look ahead at the future and say, what kind of, what kind of church person am I going to be? And what kind of minister am I going to be? And um, to, to get it settled again in my heart, like I can pastor, I can serve, I can minister in obscurity in small ways by faith, just trusting God is going to take care of all the outcome and it's so hard to measure success in ministry. That's why we rely on numbers of indoctrinated people or the money that people give or the number of downloads because it's hard to measure. And, but that's, I think we have to serve by faith. And so that's one of the convictions I'm, I'm leaving with. Man, you guys know a mango tree takes seven years to bear fruit. Just a, a random tidbit. Also, a tree is 30. Note, 30. Allegedly, that's yeah, what I've yeah. heard. 30 years. That's a long time, man. <laughs> um, Takeaway for me, I, I just want to say, first of all, that coming full circle, Phil Driscoll is actually not one of the producers of Adventures in Odyssey. He is only the trumpet player, and it's Phil. Phil uh, is a different Phil. His name is Phil Lawler. Anyways, um, my bad, Phil Lawler. I didn't give you your, your props. Now I have. And yeah, I'm just, I'm really grateful um, that we can at least amongst ourselves, right? If, and encourage people like, if you don't have a community of people growing in truth and freedom and things like that, um, maybe maybe hit us up on this podcast. We'll connect you with a virtual one because it is the greatest blessing I've found in life um, to have people that will speak the truth in love. Guys, uh, thank you so much for participating in this conversation and sharing your reflections, the questions. Uh, I, I really, I really do value it. Um, this is the end of our time, and you know, this is something that I think we'll try to do every once in a while. It's not going to be a weekly thing. Uh, that's what we have, you know, the move for. So, if you are interested in this journey and this 
this uh, transformation, this growth that takes place as we spend more time in scripture and with God. It's a podcast where we spend, you know, 10 minutes. I say 10 minutes loosely. It's never been 10 minutes, but you say 10 minutes uh, <laughs> aspirationally. Um, but it's, it's, it's a place where we get to just spend time in scripture. And if that's something that you're into, we'd love to have you along for the ride. Um, if you have any thoughts or questions or things that you'd want to add to the conversation, do let us know in the comments below this video. Otherwise, if you have another subject or a theme or something that you'd like us to maybe do another roundtable conversation like this, do let us know in the comments below and we'll definitely give it some consideration. Thank you again so much for your time. We'll see you guys in the next episode. Thank <laughs> you.